good morning, everyone. It's good to see everybody here today. Open your Bibles, if you would, 1 Kings chapter 18. 1 Kings chapter 18. It is the Lord's Day, a time where we can come together and do what we've done today to be able to remember our Lord's death, his burial, and his resurrection, to be able to express our gratitude to our Father for the hope that we have through him and the fact that we can come to our Father through him. And I appreciate everyone's desire to be here. You know, it was just a few weeks ago, I was out of town and Ron did a lesson on Elisha, and he made me want to go back and do a lesson on Elijah, and so that's what I'm going to do today. Elijah, you guess, would, would say would be the, the mentor to Elisha, and one of the great events that we find within the text of Scripture is found in 1 Kings chapter 18, and we often reflect back on the contest between Elijah and the prophets of Baal. And I want to begin this morning, I want to read some of this text with you. I'm not going to necessarily read all of it, but I want to begin at verse 17, 1 Kings chapter 18 and verse 17. Then it happened when Ahab saw Elijah, that Ahab said to him, Is that you, O troubler of Israel? And he answered, I have not troubled Israel, but you and your father's house have, in that you have forsaken the commandments of the Lord and have followed the Baals. Now, therefore, send and gather all Israel to me on Mount Carmel, the 450 prophets of Baal and the 400 prophets of Asherah who eat at Jezebel's table. And that's where I'm going to stop. <laughs> the, the idea that's set forth from verse 20 through the end of the chapter what takes place is, is very, I guess, awe-inspiring to me when I consider God and his power, considering the faithfulness of Elijah in the light of the circumstances that are surrounding him. But when I consider Elijah's confrontation with the prophets of Baal, it comes at a very low period of history for Israel. And when I'm speaking of Israel, we're talking about the divided kingdom now. We're not talking about the united kingdom of Israel. We're talking about the ten tribes that went off with, with Jeroboam and set up, the, where Jeroboam over in 1 Kings chapter 12 set up the golden calves. And since that rebellion, since that division of the kingdom, the, those ten tribes have, have been idolatrous. They have not been in fellowship with God. And, and when I say it's at a very low point in the history of Israel, it's not just simply because of that. It's also because of the way they've handled things. There have been assassinations and murders were actually the order of the day. Ahab was the king of Israel at this time. And at that time, there were none that had surpassed him doing evil. You look back at 1 Kings chapter 16 and verses 31 and or 31 through 33 and you see this very thing what i notice in this text like i do in, in other biblical texts is that god oftentimes will use drastic measures even great miracles like we're going to see in the text today when the faithfulness toward him is at a low point i go back to the book of judges and I see the cycle that the whole nation, when it was united, even went through of faithfulness and unfaithfulness and God raising up a nation and then God raising up a judge, restoration and then falling away. We see that all the time. And even now with, with Israel, the northern ten tribes, this is what they are experiencing. Elijah is going to stand against 450 prophets of Baal, 400 prophets of the Asherah, 
and though all of them have been eating at the table of Jezebel. That means when we think about Jezebel and her role in this, we know what happens to the ultimate demise of Jezebel and, and her husband. But it was Jezebel's influence over her husband because she came from an idolatrous nation. Much like you think, you consider this for just a moment, think of all the wives that, and concubines that Solomon had and how they uh, influenced him in his life and how he fell away from God. Well, this is just one woman was very powerful influence over her husband. And it has led a nation of people astray. Well, what I see here are those who are following false teaching, false doctrines, you know, false worship. But then on the other hand, there's one man, Elijah, who's willing to stand up against all of these people. He's going to go against them, and he's going to, to be victorious. Yeah, I told you the end of the story before we got to it. But you think of what's happening. There are not very many faithful people in Israel right now. A little later on, Elijah is going to be a little dis discouraged, believing he's the only one left. God will have to tell him, no, that's not true. There's 7,000 others that are still faithful to me. There's a small remnant of people there. But there are still people that are faithful. And it's just like what we normally do. We go from one extreme to another. And in, and in this particular case, you know, even though Elijah may have felt like that, what he stated was definitely hyperbole. But when you think of these things and what's going to go on, you have him, the lone messenger of God, this lone prophet, He's going to teach them a lesson. And it's often a lesson that multitudes still need to hear even today. And when I think about Romans chapter 15 and verse 4, I find the benefit of looking backwards at times and looking at what we learn from the faithfulness of those in the Old Testament. When I think about this lone prophet, and what he is about to present to them, the very first thing that happens is he's going to be falsely accused. And I, I, that's why I read those two verses, or three verses, verses 17 through 21st. Because when I look at Elijah, and I, I think about him, and, and I come forward to the New Testament, and I here Jesus asking, who do people say that I am? And Elijah is one of those individuals that they say that he is. When I think of this, Elijah under the Old Testament was then a type of Christ for us. It was, he pointed us to Jesus. Well, as is with the case of Jesus, just like with Elijah, the innocent are often accused of being guilty of something that they're not. And that's what takes place as we begin. Elijah is accused by Ahab of being a troubler in Israel. Now, he really was stirring the pot, though, wasn't he? Elijah just wasn't sitting back and letting everything just happen, and he wasn't speaking out against the evil that was being perpetrated by the king and his wife and, and the idolatry that was going on. He's been speaking up all of this time, and why is he called the troubler of Israel? Is because he's getting on the nerves of Ahab. But the truth of the matter is, is what does he say? Well, he turns around and he tells Ahab, that's not true. He said, you are the one. You know, Galatians chapter 4 and verse 29, we also see that the wicked are also very good at falsely accusing and persecuting the righteous. We understand that those who do not come to, to the light often hate the light. John chapter 3 verses 19 through 21 says, For everyone practicing evil hates the light and does not come to the light, lest his deeds should be exposed. What was Elijah doing with Ahab's deeds? He was exposing them. 
Hebrews chapter 11 and verse 7. Jesus exposed everything and by which he condemned the world when he did that. Once Elijah did that, really, not Jesus. Elijah in Hebrews chapter 11, verse 7. But what happens is one's righteousness, in this particular case, Elijah's versus Ahab, renders the other's wickedness inexcusable. And that's what he's telling Ahab. What you have done is inexcusable. And because it is inexcusable, a point needs to be made. I'm going to stand up for God. And I don't care how many, really, you know, I know we know that there's 850 people that he's, he's called out right here. But really what he's saying is it doesn't matter how many false prophets, it doesn't matter how many false priests you bring out against me, I'm going to stand for God. And he does that. What happens when you think about those who are falsely accusing the innocent? Well, forsaking the commandments of the Lord is the true cause of the heartache of many. It is the trouble that is in Israel at this particular time because they have forsaken God. Well, Proverbs chapter 11 and verse 19 says this, As righteousness leads to life, so he pursues evil, pursues it to his own death. What happens to Ahab and Jezebel? They, have pursued, they will have pursued evil. And they will suffer death in the end. What's going to happen to the prophets of Baal and the Asherah? They're going to be punished with death in the end. Proverbs chapter 13 and verse 15. Good understanding gains favor, but the way of the unfaithful is hard. I really believe that this is a lesson that when you get right down to it, I don't believe that... Elijah wanted Ahab and Jezebel to suffer as much as he wanted them to repent. But we know what happens when hearts are this hard. And though time, through the things may seem well with those who, who sin, calamity and destruction will eventually befall them. Ecclesiastes chapter 8 Verses 12 and 13 says, Though a sinner does the evil a hundred times, and his days are prolonged. And you know, it's a, this is one of those things that when you look, think about this, that how can those who live so evilly or in the world today live in prosperity, live, and be, live long lives? Because even in the Old Testament and even sometimes in the New, you see that people are just wagging their heads. Why are they still prospering and the people of God are suffering well Solomon goes on to say this yet I surely know that it will be well with those who fear God who fear before him but it will not be well with the wicked nor will he prolong his days which are as a shadow because he does not fear before God well I know that our lives are but a vapor that appears for a little while I also know that we're not to say what we're going you know make these plans without God and those who do evil are making their daily plans without God they're going to die just like the righteous die but their end will not be the same because we know that the wages of sin is death we know that that in in the end God's just judgment will come upon those people and in the end those who have lived in that manner of life will suffer what God has promised that they would suffer. But what does Elijah have to do? And I want you to look at verse 21 with me for just a moment. They have now gathered at Mount Carmel in verse 20. In verse 21, And Elijah came to all the people and said, how long will you falter between two opinions? If the Lord is God, follow him. But if Baal, follow him. But the, Lord, but the people answered him not a word. Consider for just a moment that there are people in the world today that lay claim to serving God and at the same time 
they are as much a part of the world as anything else. It becomes evident in the way they talk, the way they live, but yet they cry out the name of God every now and then. And I would say that there are people here in Israel that have this split loyalty. Some will make claim to God, but at the same time, they're off with everybody else. They're doing what everybody else is doing at this particular time, and they're serving the Asherah and the Baals at the same time. Well, how about us today? Will we follow or will we make that definite stand that Elijah was making? Will we make that take a stand against religious division? Will we take a stand against secularism or, or humanism or institutional? I know what I've got up here on the screen, but there's so many other things that you can throw in here other than what's just there. Will we take a stand against political correctness or, and, and the tolerance of sin? Will we do like Elijah did and challenge the world now and stand up for God? At breakfast yesterday, we were talking and there was a comment that I, I hadn't really heard anything about it. But it may be coming soon, who knows. It may be in our lifetime, it may be just around the corner, and then again it may not happen in our lifetime. But this book right here, and I'm holding up my Bible this time, may be considered hate speech. Now what will we do with it? I saw some lips moving, keep it. Use it. Still preach it, still stand up for what's in it, still call sin, sin. See, Elijah is having to make that type of stand right now. That is something that really, as a child of God today, we need to be making that stand every day. It shouldn't be just when we are faced with, and it shouldn't be a challenge that we have to make. It should be a daily challenge in our lives. There's always going to be issues confronting each generation. Will we go along with the majority or will we examine the scriptures carefully and stand therein? Will we be the Bereans of the 21st century who are going to look at the scriptures and verify them and then live by them? We need to take a definite stand regarding total commitment to God. Because today, many people are following different gods in this world. Different Baals today. The four S's really say it all. Four different gods that are, have invaded our society. Sex. Silver. Science, sports, think about those things. They rule in some people's lives. And that's not all, okay? That's just an example. But in 2 Timothy chapter 3 and verse 4, or Philippians chapter 3 and verse 19, we hear words like, whose end is destruction, whose God is their belly, whose glory is their shame, who set their mind on earthly things. And those are only used to to present a worldly mindset. Remember, we are supposed to have a heavenly mindset, not just a political mindset, a, a secular mindset, but one which our worldview is centered upon heaven, not upon those things that simply gratify the flesh. Elijah's question then is just as applicable today. It's just as forceful today when we sing out and we cry out, how long will you falter between two opinions? And unfortunately, you'll get the same response in many cases that Elijah got, silence. Because some individuals will not want to speak up. Some individuals will just go back and they believe that they can continue serving 
the way that they want to. But what we learn is divided loyalties are impossible to maintain. You cannot serve two masters, according to Matthew chapter 6. Because you will either love one and hate the other, despise one and love the other. You eventually make a choice. And what these people were doing that day by not making that choice, they did make a choice. They were turning from God. Well, many people then have hewn out broken cisterns for themselves. Jeremiah chapter 2 and verse 13. For my people have committed two evils. They have forsaken me, the fountain of living waters, and hewn, out for, the, hewn for themselves cisterns, broken cisterns, that cannot hold, that can hold no water. That's the problem with making those two choices like that or trying to combine them. Faithfulness would be impossible for them. Well, look at verses 22 through 29 now. Then Elijah said to the people, I alone am left a prophet of the Lord, but Baal's prophets are 450 men. Therefore, let them give us two bulls and let them choose one bull for themselves and cut it in pieces and lay it on the wood put it on put no fire under it and i will prepare the bull and lay it on wood but put no fire under it then you call on the name of your gods and i will call on the name of the lord and the god who answers by fire he is god so all the people answered and said it is well spoken now Elijah said to the prophets of Baal, Choose one bull for yourselves and prepare it first, for you are many, and call on the name of your God. But put no fire under it. So they took the bull which was given them, and they prepared it and called on the name of Baal from morning even till noon, saying, O Baal, hear us. But there was no voice. No one answered. Then they leaped around the altar which they had made. And so it was at noon that Elijah mocked them and said, Cry aloud, for he is a God. Either he is meditating, or he is busy, or he is on a journey. Or perhaps he is sleeping and must be awakened. So they cried aloud and cut themselves, as was their custom with knives and lances, until the blood gushed out of them. And when midday was passed, they prophesied until the time of offering of the evening sacrifice. But there was no voice. No one answered. No one paid attention. It also reminds me of the prophet Isaiah and the challenge that God presented to Israel there about the gods being made of wood and stone and not being able to speak. See, you think about it. Elijah in his stand was not obligated to really show them any type of kindness in this, was he? He wasn't being patting them on the back and saying, don't worry, it'll all be all right. That's not what happened. They were not worthy of that type of kindness at this particular time. And in essence, the mocking that he gave them the proverb writer would have said something like this in Proverbs 26 and verse 4, Do not answer a fool according to his folly, lest you be like him. Well, he's making fun of them. He's mocking them. And the reason he can do that with the confidence that he has is because he knows that those gods are not real. At times, a little rebuke, a little scorn, a little derision might be in order like they were right here. Micaiah's answer to Ahab in 1 Kings chapter 22 and verse 15 is an example. When he told him exactly what he wanted to hear, he knew he would not listen no matter what he said. Isaiah displays how the people were fools in Isaiah chapter 44, verses 15 through 18. Amos 
in chapter 4 and verse 4 says this, Come to Bethel and transgress. At Gilgai, multiply transgression. Bring your sacrifices every morning, your tithes every three days. Was that what Amos was really trying to tell them at the time? No. He wasn't wanting them to do this, but he was wanting to show them what they were doing was fruitless. God would make Ezekiel's forehead like flint. Sometimes we need to be stubborn when it comes to holding to the truth. Jesus in Matthew chapter 16 and verse 4. When he told them that they would receive nothing but the sign of Jonah, these people were ignorant of what that true sign of Jonah meant. They didn't have the faintest idea what the sign of Jonah truly represented. And if they had followed Jesus, they could have seen many other signs. But Jesus would not work miracles just to please them, please the unrighteous people, please the hypocrite. He told them what they would see that would prove to them that he truly was the Son of God. You see, in Matthew chapter 21, these individuals tried to expose Jesus. And they asked him by what authority he did these things. And Jesus would turn the table on them, not really showing them any kindness in the process. But he would say, you answer this for me and then I'll answer you. The baptism of John, did it come from heaven or men? See, these men came to expose Jesus to the people as having no authority. However, what did he do? He demonstrated heavenly authority. What is Elijah getting ready to do within this? He's getting ready to, he's showing them that these men, you have no authority. But now, when it's his turn, he's going to show them who the true authority is. He's going to reveal to them that it is the God of heaven. And he is going to reveal to them the power of God, the awesome power of God. Now, I'm not going to read verses 30 through 39. But I want you to pay attention that when Elijah gets his turn, everybody comes closer. He tells them, come near. He's drawing their attention to what's happened. He's going to point out, you know, you've seen the failure over here. But let's do something different. Let's pour water over my sacrifice. No, let's dig a trench around my sacrifice. And we're going to pour enough water over it that we're going to fill that trench and it's going to overflow. And he does. He says, now you wait and see what true power is. And he cries out to God. And what happens? Fire will come down from heaven. Consuming the sacrifice, the water, the altar. And what was his argument from the very beginning? that whoever did something like this would be the one true God. This should be that very thing that when our text reveals to us, God uses the power of, <coughs> power of fire once again and what it did, and we often forget the magnitude of that power. We often forget the magnitude of the power that was manifested through Jesus Christ. Because if you think about him, what did he do on occasion? He would raise someone who was dead. John chapter 11. Lazarus would come forth from the tomb. Magnificent, awesome power. Heavenly power. But I do want you to look at verse 40. Because in this text... After all the water had been licked up in the trench. And when the people saw it, what did they do in verse 39? They fell on their faces. They fell on their faces and they cried out, The Lord, He is God. The Lord, He is God. There's no denying it now. And then in verse 40, And Elijah said to them, 
seized the prophets of Baal. Do not let one of them escape. So they seized them, and Elijah brought them down to the brook Kishon and executed them there. The vengeance of God is severe. Let me go back. I went and got ahead of myself. The vengeance of God is definitely severe. Severe. Idolatry under the old law was actually punishable by death. Deuteronomy chapter 13 and 17. And what we learned then, in a, figuratively right here, our God then is a consuming fire. Very much like what the Hebrew writer talks about. God will punish all false religionists, all those who teach error. They are not punished necessarily at the same time like we see here in our text. But they're not punished, not because their offense is less grievous than the prophets of Baal, but because of the long-suffering nature of our God. 2 Peter chapter 3 and verse 9, God is not willing that any should perish, but is long-suffering toward us. Why? Because he wants us to repent. He wants all to come to repentance. But God will punish the unfaithful. <clears throat> God will punish those who claim to be children of His today because of their unfaithfulness. It will be those who are righteous that will hear the words, Well done, good and faithful servant. Enter into the joy of your Lord. There will be those who have made this claim and, and tried to serve two masters. And he'll, they'll hear the words, Depart from me. I never knew you. Just like in Elijah's day, God was wanting to turn the hearts of men back to him. And he wants to do the same today. He wants our hearts turned to him. He wants us confidently st stating the Lord, he is God, the Lord, he is God. But he doesn't want it to just be lip service. He wants it to be life service. God loved these people who were actually worshiping the prophets, worshiping the Baals, enough to perform this great sign to bring them back, to have this point of reconciliation with them. And even though God is severe, He is also loving and merciful. And just like He told the children of Israel, we can do this today. Seek the Lord while He may be found. Call upon him while he is near. Let the wicked forsake his way and the unrighteous man his thoughts. Let him return to the Lord and he will have mercy on him and to our God for he will abundantly pardon. We get that through Jesus Christ. Micah chapter 7 verses 18 and 19. Who is a God like you? Pardoning iniquity and passing over the transgressions of the remnant of his heritage. He does not retain his anger forever because he delights in mercy. He will again have compassion on us and will subdue our iniquities. You will cast all our sins into the depths of the sea. The Hebrew writer states that he will remember our sins no more. He accomplishes that through the blood of Jesus Christ. So God wants all men to be saved. 1 Timothy chapter 2 and verse 4 is something he says right there in the very same thing. He wants our hearts to turn back to him. God wants us to repent and be converted. Acts chapter 3 and verse 19. Who's Peter preaching to on that day? He's letting some people know that they had crucified an innocent man. He's letting them know that they were at fault for Jesus' death. And he sits there and tells them, repent therefore and be converted. And so, we have to make a choice each day. To serve God or mammon. We can't serve both. We have to throw our faith on that altar of God's consuming fire. And live there, cleansed by the blood of the Lamb. We cannot remain servants of sin in our lives. Do you not know that?
to whom you present yourselves slaves to obey, you are that one slave whom you obey, whether of sin leading to death or of obedience leading to righteousness. That's your choice. You see, there are many lessons to be learned from stories in the Old Testament. Testament, We've gleaned some truths from Elijah's confrontation with the prophets of Baal. May we take lessons like these to heart. Our God is still trying to turn the hearts of men toward him. He's using men, children of God, not just men that fill the pulpit. He's using people like you, asking you to take a stand for the truth of the gospel. Not being shy in making that proclamation. And so we must take the challenge of the gospel to the world. We must let it work in the hearts of men like it did in the first century. Our job is to plant and to water and let God provide the increase. Because it will produce people after God's own heart when it falls on those good and honest hearts. So brethren, take a stand for the truth just like Elijah. Dig your feet in. Don't back down. Make God first and foremost in your life. Wake up every morning saying, the Lord, he is God. Take out your songbooks. The song we're about to sing serves as a song of encouragement to those who may need to respond to the invitation of our Lord. And that opportunity can be yours this morning. Do you need to Reconcile your life in obedience to the gospel. Do you believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God? Do you believe that the blood of that Lamb of God can cleanse you of all of your unrighteousness, all of your sins, that you can be reconciled to God? Let's act in faith then and, and do that which brings you into a covenant relationship with your Lord, with your God. Repent of your sins, confessing before men, and be baptized for the remission of your sins. If you're wearing the name Christian and you find yourself serving two masters choose today who you will serve reconcile your life to God we stand ready to assist you with prayer and encouragement but won't you come to the great position this morning as together we stand and as we sing the great position